Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem number of zero filled subarrays. We're given an integer array of nums and we want to return the number of subarrays filled with zero. So given this subarray, we can see that we have these two zeros over here and these two zeros over here. So you might think, well, does that mean we have two subarrays filled with zeros? That's what I thought at first, but actually when you think about it more closely, these are two subarrays, but within each of these, we have this subarray with just a single zero, and we have this subarray with just a single zero, and we have this subarray and this subarray. So it's true that we will need to find like these consecutive zeros, but just because there are two zeros and that's like a single subarray, that can actually be broken up into two more subarrays of size one. So in total, we have six subarrays. This counts as three subarrays of zeros, and this counts as three as well. Add those together, we have a total of six. In other words, we have four subarrays of size one, and we have two subarrays of size two. So I'm gonna work our way backwards from this problem. Because once you kind of see this, where your mind might first go is by just getting every contiguous subarray, suppose these two, like we count the number of subarrays and we also have the length. So we have two subarrays of length two. Let's say this is the length and this is the count. And we know that each subarray of length two actually counts as three subarrays of zero. So we could basically do this. And when we have this calculation after we've iterated through the entire array, then we would take this count two and multiply it by three. Now, what if we had some subarrays of length one? Like we have three subarrays maybe of length one. Suppose maybe like this one didn't exist, this one didn't exist, and there was like a zero over here. That's an example would be. Well, a subarray of just one zero just counts as a single subarray. What about if we have three consecutive zeros? How many subarrays would that be? Well, subarrays of length one, there would be three of them. Subarrays of length two, there would be two of them, one over here and one over here. And subarrays of length three, there's one of them. So in total, we counted six subarrays when we have three consecutive zeros. What about when we have four consecutive zeros? Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then 10 is just the entire one. So we have 10 when we have four consecutive zeros. So this is kind of one way we could do it. We could get every subarray, get the length of it, and then map it to how many we ended up getting. And then using that, like let's say we had one subarray of length four. So we would have like a mapping like this. And we know subarrays of length four actually have 10 zero filled subarrays. This is a valid way to solve this problem, but let me show you a pattern because there's definitely a pattern here. When we have a single zero, that's one subarray. When we have two zeros, that's three subarrays. When we have three zeros, that's six. When we have four zeros, that's 10. Notice what's happening here. When we go down here, we're doing a plus two. When we go down here, we're doing a plus three. When we go down here, we're doing a plus four. And I can tell you that this pattern is going to repeat. When we go down again, we're going to do plus five. So we're noticing a pattern here. How can we use it to our advantage? Well, before I tell you that, let me tell you why I know for sure that this is the pattern. It actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Take a look at this. When we have a single zero, that's just one subarray. When we add another zero here, this itself, this new zero is a subarray and these two zeros are also a subarray. That's why we do plus two. Using this new zero, it's a part of two subarrays, this and this. And same exact thing with this third zero. When we introduce it, it's a part of three subarrays because that's the number of zeros that are, like that's a total number of contiguous zeros we have now. We have one subarray, two subarrays, and three subarrays, including this zero. We already knew we had a bunch of subarrays here, but we're not counting these because we already had those zeros. By introducing another zero, this zero is a part of three new subarrays. Same thing with this fourth one. This is a subarray that we just introduced. This is a subarray we introduced. This is a subarray we introduced. And this is a subarray that we introduced. 
I know I'm repeating myself a lot, but I bet this makes a ton of sense to you now why this pattern is how it is. So using this idea, we can actually solve this problem by iterating through the array just a single time and we don't need any extra memory. Let me show you how I'm gonna do that. We're gonna have a pointer I. We're gonna iterate through every position. We don't care about anything that's not a zero, of course. So when we get to this position, we don't care, just skip it. When we get here, it's not a zero, just skip it. When we get here, we found a zero. So what we're gonna do is, well, this itself is a subarray. So we're gonna take our result and it was initially zero, but we're gonna add one to it. We're also gonna keep track of the length of how many consecutive zeros that we're seeing. Cause now when we shift our pointer over here, now we're at the second zero. Since this is the second zero, you tell me how many new subarrays does this zero introduce? Two, just itself, that's one subarray, and this itself, because we know there was a previous zero because we're keeping track of how many consecutive zeros we have. Well, let's say we'll keep track of that in our count variable. Initially it was one, now we're at two. There's two, so this number, the number of consecutive zeros is what we're gonna be adding to our result every time. So now we're gonna say one plus two is the result. So let me just clean this up a bit. Our total result is three. We already visited this, we already visited this, and now we get to a non-zero. So we're gonna take our count, which was previously set to two, but now we're gonna reset it down to zero because this is not a zero. So our consecutive zeros is gonna be reset. So we skip this guy, but now we see another zero. So we're gonna take our count of zeros and now increment it. Now it's gonna be set to one, it's over here. So we're gonna take this one, add it to our result, three plus one, and we're gonna shift our pointer from here over here again. It's once again a zero, so we're gonna take our count and add one to it, because now we have two consecutive zeros, so now our count is gonna be two, and this two value is what we're going to add to our result. So now our result is three plus one plus two, which is gonna be a total of six. Then we're gonna iterate again to this last position. It's a four though, so we're gonna take our count and reset it back down to zero. Zero added to the result is not gonna do anything. So you can kind of see how we're gonna probably code this up. But now we're done with the array, our result is six, and that's what we're gonna return. If we ended up having a streak of maybe three consecutive zeros, we would have basically done the same thing just kept incrementing our count and then taking that value and adding it to our result. But you can see that this algorithm is clearly big O of N, no extra memory, so the memory is big O of one. Now let's code it up. There's multiple ways to code this up, so I will show you two of them. One that kind of comes natural to me where we have a pointer and our result, I'm gonna initialize these both to zero and then we're just gonna iterate while our pointer is in bounds of the array. We're gonna have our count, which is gonna count the number of consecutive zeros. I'm gonna initialize it to zero. And then I'm gonna have a nested loop. So while our pointer is in bounds, cause we definitely don't want it to go out of bounds. And while the value that we're currently at, num at index i is equal to zero, while that's the case, we're going to be incrementing our count and shifting our pointer and adding that count to the result. Now, if we don't encounter any zeros, we would still want to increment our i pointer. So I'm gonna do that out here. And if we did end up encountering some zeros, well, this would either leave off out of bounds because we visited every value or it would end at a non-zero value. So it would be okay to increment our pointer out here. And after that, we can just go ahead and return our result. So I'll run this to make sure that it works. And as you can see, it does. I'll quickly show you another way to code this up. I prefer this way, even though it's slightly more code, but let me show you the other way. It's using a for loop. So we don't need our I pointer. We have our result. We're gonna set it to zero and we would have actually our count variable and declare it outside of the loop. So this count is basically going to represent the exact same thing. It's just that we're gonna have it out of the scope of the while loop. You'll see why in just a second. But here, we're actually not gonna have a while loop. I misspoke. We're gonna have our for loop in range of the length of the nums array. I'm not sure what's going on with leak code syntax highlighting, but I think our code is correct, so I'll continue. 
So there's two possibilities. Either the value at index i is equal to zero or it's not equal to zero. If it is equal to zero, then we want to increment our count by one. So I'll do that. If it's not equal to zero, then we're going to reset our count to zero. Maybe it's already equal to zero, but it does no harm to us to set it to zero again. And lastly, we always want to take the count and add it to the result because either it's gonna be equal to zero, in which case this won't do anything, or it's gonna tell us how many consecutive zeros we have seen. And in that case, we would want to add those to the result. So you can see that this does work out in both cases. It's just for me that this is like a less natural solution, but if you prefer it, that's perfectly fine. Let's run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see, yes, it does. I guess it's a bit more efficient, but the big O time complexity is the same. If this was helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. It has a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.